So we um, work also on antibiotics, but we don't work with oceans uh, compounds from the oceans. So they are also so a lot of antibiotics are natural products, but they are also antibiotics that have been derived from more conventional chemical components. And this is the area where we work. So we work with uh, small molecules, but we think we be, need to be smart in choosing the right targets to bring the, the small molecules and the targets together to have a chance to develop new antibiotics. So we work in the very early stages of uh, antibiotic drug discovery. So this is the general drug discovery pipeline. So you to, in a target-based approach, so we've, the fonts we follow in my group, you start with a characterized target, then you need the small molecule that inhibits the target, you progress this then to more optimized compounds until you have a preclinical candidate, and then the compound will go into the clinical, will go into the clinical phases. So we work in the very early phases here. So we have developed methods which can help us to prioritize the targets, so which are the good targets to work on. And then we work with hit discovery and optimization. So if you think about the target. What makes a good target? So first of all, it has to be biology relevant. So in the area of antibiotic drug discovery, it has to be the case that if you disturb the target, you have to kill the, the bacteria in the bug. In order to do this, we need to be able to perturb the target with an agent. And very often still in the area of antibiotics, we want to have small molecules, compounds that the patient can just swallow and that can then kill the, target, uh, the, the bacteria. And that means, that the target has to have a pocket where the small molecule can fit in. So if you think very schematically about different uh, targets, they come in different uh, shapes and sizes, and they also have binding sites that come in different shape and sizes. So they can be uh, deep, deeply reaching deeply into the protein. This can be very flat binding site, or it can be very small binding sites, for example. And not all of these binding sites are equally suited for, for drug discovery. So in order to get good affinity with a compound that is already available, you need a, you need a binding site that can bind a, a drug-like ligand. So a drug-like ligand is, uh, has certain properties. Typically, it must not be too small, must not be, and it must not be too small, must not be too big, must have the right polarity. So this is a drug-like ligand, and we know that these are the type of compounds we need to discover. Then we need the binding site that can bind these drug-like ligands with a high with high affinity. And these binding sites are to be called druggable binding sites. So we need to find the binding sites that are druggable in order to have a good chance to develop uh, drugs in general, but also antibiotics. So how, how do can we find these binding sites? So the properties of a binding site, they are important for that. And this is typically, as I said before, it's the size, the charge, and the hydrophobic character. If we know the 3D structure of a protein, if we have the crystal structure or homology model, then we can infer the properties uh, of the binding sites from the protein structure. And that's a, so some years ago in my group, we have to develop a computational method that can help us doing this and that can help then us to prioritize the targets. So how does this method work or how have we derived it? So we have a, a data set of um, proteins which were annotated to have either druggable or less druggable binding sites. And we had the crystal structures of all these proteins in the data set. We knew where the binding site is in the data set. We can then calculate the uh, descriptors for, for all the, the targets, uh, which are all the pockets that are in this binding site. So we can uh, calculate how large the pocket is, for example, how solvent exposed and so on. We can then use machine learning models to derive a, uh, a predictor. And then we can use this predictor to score unknown proteins. And this uh, worked actually quite well. So we had an accuracy on the test set, which was not used to derive the model of about 9.0.94. So we can very well now separate the truckable binding sites from the less truckable binding sites. And then we can use this method to, um, to find protein targets uh, that have a, a high likelihood that we can, up, can come up with small uh, truck-like ligands and that are for generally good targets. So then we, we looked into um, the, um, all the proteins that were known from Pseudomonas aeruginosa to find the...
response that does suitable targeting. Colleagues in the project, they generated a database, so called Aeropass database, and there was gene information stored from Pseudomonas albinosa. So that is a Pseudomonas albinosa, is a gram negative bacteria for which we urgently need new antibiotics. So in this Aeropass database, we had information about a bit over 5,000 genes, and the genes were annotated. And about the thousands of these genes were annotated to be perturbative. So this means they are either essential, potentially essential, or virulence factors. And out of this, uh, uh, for, uh, for this about 1,000 genes, we had uh, crystal structures for uh, 77 gene products. And for another 565 gene products, we didn't have the direct crystal structure from the protein from Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but we had the crystal structure from homologous proteins. And then we can use our um, targetability prediction methods to find the proteins that have a uh, have binding sites that are targeted. So we could make predictions for about 265 gene products for the for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And some of the um, the proteins that are predicted to have a trackable binding site, they are um, part of the fatty acid synthesis cycle. So that is a quite, uh, fatty acid synthesis is a quite complex uh, biochemical pathway, has many enzymes involved. And um, we predicted that these enzymes with a red circle in the pathway that they are trackable, so they have trackable binding sites. And in my group, we started then to work on the ones in green, so the PANK, the FABB, and the FABF. And in the remainder of the talk, I will talk about our hit discovery efforts for the FABF enzyme. So why did we look at the fatty acid synthesis uh, pathway in general? Uh, this uh, pathway is known to be or suggested to be a good target for antibiotics because it's essential in many bacterial pathogens, and it's very different from uh, human fatty acid synthesis. So it's believed that it's easy, relatively straightforward to get selective uh, compounds that hit the, the enzymes in the bacteria, but not in, in humans. So there should be less problems with side effects. This is the pathway has already also proven um, evidence for being trackable or leading to drugs because um, Isoniazide, which is an antibiotic used to treat the uh, tuberculosis, has actually as a target also one of the enzymes in this pathway. Okay, so the pathway seems to be a, a good source of targets, and we uh, focused on the FABF in this pathway. So this catalyzes uh, the rate limiting condensation of myelinyl ACP with acyl AP. So this is this step here. So ACP is a uh, um, acyl carrier protein, and this is connected to malonyl, and then this is uh, reacting with the coin fatty acid chain to uh, lead to a chain prolongation of the fatty acid, and then this can go several times to the cycle to get longer and longer fatty acids. So the say the FABF is catalyzing this, this rate limiting step here. And that's the enzyme we work, we work with. There are a few compounds known that inhibit this uh, FABF, uh, the most prominent is probably blood enzymycin, shown here it's a natural product. This is active against gram-positive bacteria, but not against gram-negative bacteria. But if you knock out uh, um, an efflux pump in E. coli, then uh, blood enzymycin is also active against the E. coli. So this suggests that the, the target works also in the gram-negatives, but there is um, transport issues or efflux issues with this compound. And then we have a covalent inhibitor, for example, the serolinine. Uh, this uh, is also relatively potent, but because it's uh, it's quite reactive also, so it lacks selectivity and therefore has toxicity issues. And in recent years, there have been also fatty acid channel ligands been reported, and they are currently investigated as preclinical candidates against um, TB2. So we, so I said, we uh, it seems to be an interesting target, but the problem is this core inhibitors here that are known is that they are natural products. So they are very difficult to synthesize and they're very difficult to modify and optimize. So, so we were looking for more simpler uh, chemical compounds that we can uh, better modify and optimize to work on the FABF. So in order to do this, we first determined the crystal structure of the Pseudomonas aeruginosa FABF some years ago. Uh, nowadays, we also have the crystal structure and complex with the blood enzymycin, which is binding here. And this is occupying the binding site where the malonyl-CoA uh, binds. 
And then we can superimpose this with the crystal structure that has the serotonin bound. You can see that binds in the, in the fatty acid channel here. So in principle, we have two binding sites that we can target. We have the fatty acid channel and we have the melanin coin pocket. Okay, when we want to target an enzyme, we also need binding assays that we can measure if the compounds bind. We use a method called biolayer interformity for that. So principally, we can measure the on and the off rates of the compounds, and we can also determine the KDs, but I'm not going more into detail in this now because of time reasons. And we also have an NMR-based, pretty simple screening assay where we can just say binding or non-binding. We have the assays, and we can look for new compounds. Uh, in the first approach, we, we used the virtual screening approach. So at that time, we had the database of about 5 million commercially available compounds in the groups. We first filtered this for lead-like compounds, so compounds that are not too large and not too polar and not too hydrophobic. We could also use the, the crystal structure and the knowledge about how the platensimycin is binding to develop a pharmacophore hypothesis. So for example, we require that all compounds have a hydrophobic feature in that region of the binding site. They should be able to, and they should be able to form certain hydrogen bonds with the surrounding residues. Then we had about 50,000 compounds left that fulfill this pharmacophore filter. And then we can use a docking program to predict the binding modes of these compounds in the binding sites. So the software docks all the places, all the compounds, in the, in the FAPF binding site generates several conformation of the, the compounds bound to the, the protein, and then you score them for how well they fit, and then you can order your hit list according to the scores. Then we use the, on this list, then we use the pharmacore filter again to see if in the doc poses they actually bind as we would like them to bind. And then at the end, you always need to look at the compounds and we purchased uh, about 18 of the ones that we visually inspected. And we got the crystal structure of the one of the hits in complex with our protein. So here's the electron density map, which we get from the X-ray crystallography. And it was very easy to place the, the small molecule into this binding site. And we superimpose this with the um, latencimycin. Then we can see that it binds in the malonyl coa pocket. So we tried also then to optimize this compound is rather weak. Um, and we tried to optimize this to bind uh, to bind better, but that turned out to be actually uh, quite difficult because there, there's some solubility issues with this compound. And also we didn't have the, the right vectors to grow the molecule in the way where we wanted it to grow. We have abundant this year at the moment. And then we used an alternative approach for, for hit discovery. And this is a, a method co called fragment screening. So in fragment screening, it's an experimental approach and you work with, with compound libraries that co contain so-called fragments. So fragments are chemical, small, uh, small molecules that are smaller than typical drugs or lead line compounds. So they typically have an upper side of about 300 to 350 Daltons. So why do we use these small compounds? Because with smaller compounds, it's e more easy, to, or you get the better exploration of the chemical space with smaller compounds than you have with larger compounds. Because with smaller compounds, it's not possible to synthesize that many different compounds. So with a smaller subset, you cover actually, relatively speaking, a larger area of chemical space than if you have the same size of a library with larger compounds. So a typical fragment library is about just a thousand compounds. The disadvantage of working with fragments is that they come with lower affinity. So you need quite sensitive biophysical methods to detect the binding. And then because they, they typically bind weak, so afterwards you need to optimize the compounds and, and grow them. So, but, so that's the, the approach we used. And as a screening method, we used directly X-ray crystallography in that case. So we did that together with the XCAM facility as the diamond synchrotron in the UK. So the postdoc, he prepared uh, about uh, 1,700 crystals, which were then uh, soaked with the fragments that they had available at Diamond. This resulted in about 900 crystals that diffracted the X-ray beams, and uh, about 850 of them, we could, uh, he could solve the, the crystal structure. And then at Diamond, they have a very nice computational pipeline to see um, if a ligand has bound to the crystals. And what you get out is then something like this. So each, uh, so in, in this red color, this is the, the atoms from our target, so the FAPF. And each dot is a binding event. And if it's a bobble, then there are several uh, fragments bound at the same place. 
And then I have also shown some here with spheres which are bind in, in a different region. So you get lots of binding events. And we are interested mainly in the ones that bind into the um, malonic CoA or in the fatty acid binding channel. So we found six fragments that bind close or in or close to the malonic CoA binding site and 11 fragments that bind into the fatty acid channel. So now we can try to optimize these compounds to get a higher affinity. And what's very interesting is that if we superimpose the crystal structure with the serolinine, so the covalent inhibitor with, with the structures that had the fragments bind, we can see that this reactive uh, warhead of the serolinine is basically just sticking out of the area where our fragments are binding. So what we are trying at the moment is to turn some of our fragments into covalent uh, inhibitors and then join all the seven fragments together to get a, a potent inhibitor. Because actually a lot of uh, antibiotics are covalent inhibitors, especially penicillin, where it's a prime example of a covalent inhibitor. So we believe by having a covalent inhibitor, it would be a very good strategy also for, for antibiotic drug development. And we have, we have synthesized the, the first generation of the compounds. We could also the crystal structure of one of the, the optimized compounds or the compounds we try to optimize in complex with the fab it's indeed covalently binding to where we want it, uh, to the cysteine which we want to attack, but the binding mode is not the ones which we, we had models. And now we're trying to make more compounds to improve that one. And this is already bringing me to the end of the talk. So we believe that FABF is a promising target for new antibiotics because it's essential for the for a lot of bacteria. In addition, it contains a trackable binding site. And we have used a virtual screening and fragment screening to discover a number of hits. And now the optimization of these compounds is ongoing. So here is a list of some of the current and former group members. And the trackability work was mainly done by Agata Krasovsky, Dani Mutas, and Orichit Saka. And the virtual screening was carried out by Rafael Klein. And um, Harris and Ludwig, they are currently working on the FABF and the HIT optimization. And thank you for your, uh, thank you for your attention.